Welcome back everyone uh, for our first plenary of the day. Uh, so today it's our pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Andrew Stroh, so who is professor at the Institute of uh, Biology at the University of Fribourg in Germany and the head of the Stroh Lab in the same university since 2016. Um, so he completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Southern California in the United States and a PhD at the University of Adelaide in Australia. Then he joined the California Institute of Technology at Pasadena for his postdoctoral, his first postdoctoral position for six years. Then from uh, 2010 to 2015, Andrew continued his research at the Institute of Molecular Pathology in Vienna, Australia. Meanwhile, in 2012, he got funded with a ARC that allowed him to explore the neural circuit of visual guidance in flying flies and uh, that opened up to his current position actually in the University of Freiburg. Um, his research focuses on the neural mechanism underlying uh, visual behaviors uh, such as navigation in Drosophila. And to do so, he, he and uh, his team develop advanced technical tools uh, such as virtual reality to be able to study behavior and to explore brain mechanisms simulta simultaneously. Um, once again, it's our great pleasure uh, to welcome you to give this talk entitled Learning about a Real World, uh, Insect Vision and Navigation Using Virtual World. So uh, you can go ahead uh, when you want. Thank you. So thanks very much for uh, the, the introduction and the invitation. Um, exactly. So I will talk about learning about real world insect vision and navigation using virtual worlds. And here is already an example of our uh, virtual reality system. So you s what, what you're seeing here on the left is a Drosophila flying around. It's, it's too small, uh, it, it, it's just less than a pixel. So we highlight it with a, um, with a red circle there. And we're tracking that with a bunch of cameras from above with really low latency so that we know where it is in 3D just a few milliseconds uh, after it, it was there. And then using computer games technology, we can build a model of a world that we want the fly to be in and then using that uh, computer games technology some more we can then render through computer projectors on the sides of the arena where the fly is actually flying what we need to show so that the fly would see that it was in this kind of world uh, and so if we do an experiment where we where we have this post in the middle of our real arena this virtual post and we look at fly trajectories uh, in, in that arena from a top view, or if we look uh, in a situation where we removed that virtual post in a control condition, we can see they clearly uh, avoid the, this virtual post uh, when, it, when it's actually present. So we think that actually virtual reality is a good name for, for this kind of technology. And so this is a visual virtual reality. And I will tell you a little bit more about, about this kind of technology uh, in, a, in a couple minutes. First, actually, I wanted to, to say a couple um, introductory words about virtual reality. So I, I found this old quote, uh, in fact, by the person who named the word virtual reality, Jaron Lanier. So it's a very interesting kind of reality. It's absolutely as shared as the physical world. Some people say that, well, the physical world isn't all that real. It's a consensus world. But the thing is, however real the physical world is, which we can never really know, the virtual world is exactly as real and achieves the same status. And so actually, this idea about sharing it and achieving the same status really made me think of the Animal Behavior Live team. Um, so we're having this conference, uh, which, is, which is really great, and we're having a kind of a shared virtual reality. And I'm not sure that uh, Lanier would have envisaged YouTube and Discord and Zoom as the technical means by which you know virtual reality might uh, might actually take place. But thinking about it a little bit, actually, I think kind of think that's uh, that's that's what we're doing here. But actually, the second part of the quote is is maybe more directly relevant um, to my talk here. So it also has this possibility, uh, this this infinity of possibility that you don't have in the physical world. In the physical world. You can't suddenly turn this building into a tulip. It's just impossible. But in the virtual world, you can. And so, you know, one of the ideas uh, when we were developing this uh, virtual reality technology, especially pushed by uh, reviewers, uh, you know, was to say, well, look, you know, technically it's fine, but, you know, really, have you demonstrated with this 
system, you know, something you can't do with other kind of experimental techniques. So one of the one of the fun things that we did um, in a in a response to that kind of criticism from the reviewers was we built a hybrid biological and artificial swarm with zebrafish and space invaders. So this video is kind of similar um, to the to the last one I showed you, except we don't have a red circle around the zebrafish. There's a zebrafish swimming here, and the idea is that this fish is in this swarm of um, artificial space invaders, and they're they are programmed to move around uh, using a particular algorithm, actually the old Boyd's algorithm, which was uh, an initial early collective behavior algorithm invented actually to create uh, screensavers. Um, and, uh, and we had those Boyd's reacting to each other, the space invader Boyd's reacting to each other, but also reacting to the real fish. And the question was if the real fish would also react to them. And in this environment, what we had is um, actually two teleportation gates and when the fish would choose one of the gates the idea that it would go into a world without the space invaders and in which when it would choose the other gate it would go into a world with the space invaders so these are you know kind of fun and, and crazy experiments but actually in those in in that experiment the idea was maybe that the fish would learn to associate the appearance of the gate with either the presence or the absence of the of the space invaders in those experiments, we didn't find any evidence for that kind of learning, but they were also done, as I said, in the context of a, of a review of a paper. We didn't have a lot of time to optimize it. So I actually still think this, this is a pretty cool uh, technology and, and um, some interesting, interesting ideas of experiments that one can do. But actually, I want to um, focus on insect navigation in, in this talk. Uh, and so my fascination with, with navigation in insects really started when I, when I learned that insects can use vision to find home. So these are uh, photographs of a bee hunter wasp called uh, Philanthus triangulum. And so they, they dig, the female wasp will dig her nest in sand dunes and um, lay her eggs there and then actually go out and, and catch bees uh, as, as prey. And this species actually what um, Nico Tinbergen and colleagues uh, spent a long time uh, studying and they, uh, they, were, they were really interested in how she could find her nest again. And so they did uh, conceptually very kind of simple experiments where they would uh, put these shapes around the, the nest hole when, when she was digging it. Uh, and then she would fly out, look back at the nest, fly away, uh, catch her bee. Uh, and while she was doing that, the experimenters would take these shapes and, for example, move them to the side by a meter. And so then when uh, she came back, actually what they discovered is that she would go to the, to the center of the shapes. Uh, and so demonstrating that, that this wasp is using vision as a dominant cue to return home and, and that this was a, this was a visual memory. Um, and I want to point out actually a really nice poster from Anne-Kathrin Zontag, if you haven't seen that yet, she's doing sort of modern day sort of um, you know, updated uh, versions of, of these kind of experiments and, and really interesting work. Um, so the question for me that's really driving uh, a lot of the work in the lab is what are the relevant circuits uh, and how do they enable this kind of um, visual memory? So, so I'm going to return now a little bit to the virtual reality kind of technology, but this is going to uh, link back to the, to, the, to the insect navigation in a moment. So the question is, how can we study the neurobiology of animal uh, navigation? And I would say that in, in navigation, multi-sensory feedback, uh, proprioceptive information, vestibular information, touch information, vision, maybe smell, is all fundamentally important. You know, for an animal, maybe the most important thing is being in the right place at the, at the right time or not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So this, these behaviors actually use every sense that the animal can get uh, and, and so this, is, this has really been driving uh, our efforts, our, our motivation to make uh, virtual reality for freely moving animals where the animal would experience natural proprioceptive vestibular touch sensations uh, and that we could create visual virtual worlds for it um, because that will allow these natural sensations while allowing us to carefully control the visual feedback. And so we published a paper on this a, a few years ago, Visual um, Virtual Reality for Freely Moving Animals. 
The software is, is free and open source. And what I want to do is just briefly explain the key kind of principle behind this. And so the idea would be if there's an animal here viewing some objects that we want to simulate. So for example, a, a blue sphere and a, and a purple pyramid. Uh, geometrically, all we need to do is connect a line between the eye and the object and wherever that line intersects the wall of our display, if we can turn that pixel that the color the animal would have seen, that, that's what we need to do. Uh, and the trick is for a freely moving animal that we need to maintain this relationship uh, constantly as the animal moves. Uh, so the, the key point here is that it's a perspective correct rendering for a freely moving observer and obviously that requires two things technically. It requires low latency animal tracking uh, so that we know where the, the observer is and then it requires low latency graphics generation so that we can do all this geometry uh, really quickly. And um, we have this nice paper where we, where we do this with um, actually several different species of animals but we are far from the first people to do this kind of thing. So there was a really um, early paper from um, Roland Strauss and, and Karl Goetz uh, where they did free moving virtual reality actually to study Drosophila vision in a, in a really clever uh, kind of assay. Um, I'll talk in a, in a moment about, about this work and then we also in, in my lab published a kind of a precursor paper to this one. And then the lab of Anton Sirota with uh, Nick Del Grosso, they uh, published really uh, awesome uh, preprint on a rat virtual reality, so virtual reality for freely moving rats. This is also really uh, Im impressive work. Okay, so the the tracking of our system is is something I could happily talk uh, an hour about just just in in and of itself. But basically, the idea of we've got multiple cameras, uh, and we have actually really simple kind of computer vision to extract the 2D position of, of an animal, so in this case a bird, this is a collaboration with the lab of, of Doug Altschuler, um, to, to extract the 2D position of the, of the animal in the camera uh, images and then in 3D in a central computer once we gather all these individual 2D images we can then um, estimate the state of the animal in, in 3D and in fact in 6D if we want to estimate the velocity of the animal as well. Uh, and a little plug for our open source uh, software Braid, uh, we're actually, we continue to invest uh, a lot of effort into this and um, recently um, happy to get funding from the Volkswagen Foundation to be able to continue that development um, at, a, at, a good, at a good scale. So this, this multi-camera tracking software is something I really would like to make accessible and usable to the animal research community. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, please um, check it out and, and get in touch. Okay, so now to the graphics side of things. So there's, there's a, a key word here um, called anamorphosis, which means again shape. And I'm gonna play you a video which I downloaded on, on YouTube. At least I'm gonna attempt to play it. It's, okay, it's not showing. Let's see, what's the problem? I tried this last night. Okay, well, um, maybe you can uh, find this video yourself. So, so basically the idea is it, it, it looks very convincing, like we have these, all these 3D objects here on this table. Um, but actually it turns out that, that this part here with the mirror and these Rubik's cubes uh, is actually just printed on a, on a piece of paper and it's just rendered in an angle that's perfect for this camera that was, that was doing this. And, and so obviously for us right now, it probably looks very realistically three-dimensional but then the person reaches into the camera frame and turns this piece of paper around on the page um, and your sort of perception of this three-dimensional reality is, is totally uh, destroyed. Um, and so now I, I'm really hoping uh, this is going to work. So I wouldn't, yes, okay, great. So this is um, an early example from when I was doing a, a postdoc with Michael Dickinson um, where we first got this anamorphosis working in real time. Are you just now observers. getting home? So this is Wait, now is uh, this again in the middle of a long tunnel and we're projecting with computer projectors on the floor and the, and the walls of the tunnel and you can see I hope that it really looks like the fly is kind of trapped uh, into this into this virtual cylinder so in a way similar to that to that movie I showed you in in the beginning. 
Um, <clears throat> so from, from there, actually, we, when I then started my own lab, we, we worked uh, pretty, pretty heavily on, on making this real general purpose uh, software and general purpose system. And so now what I'm going to do, I'm showing you a movie from when we put a little LED on a camera, on a wide angle camera that we put into this arena. And in the arena, we're trying to simulate this kind of maze shape, this L shaped corridor, these different color walls. Um, and so now you're seeing the view uh, here on the left from that camera that's being tracked. And so we're rendering our virtual reality for this view. And so hopefully, you know, as you're in there, at least once we go into this L-shaped corridor, hopefully you get the, the perception that you're in this, in this arena. And here is now a view of that exact same movie from just another perspective. So, so now we just have a camera up above the arena. This red dot here is highlighting the, the infrared LED on, on the camera that we're tracking. So typically we do all the tracking in the infrared so that the animals um, uh, can't see it, but nevertheless we can use kind of standard cameras to do that. Um, and so now uh, in, terms of, in terms of our own work, one of the things we, we do a lot of is study visual motion responses in flies. Um, and so the visual worlds that we show, they don't have to be static, but they can actually move themselves. So of course we can you know, program uh, various things to move around. So here we program something that looks like a snowstorm. Of course, there's no wind and there's no you know, cold and there's no snow in, in the arena here, but we're blowing these little um, circles uh, around. And, and the reason that we're doing that is because we're taking advantage of a really low level visual reflex in the fly called the optimotor response. And there's some really uh, interesting talks and posters at this conference on, also on the optimotor response, also in other species like, like crabs. Um, from, from the, the lab of uh, Juliette Starker. And <clears throat> so what we're doing here is the, um, if we want the fly, so we're, we have prescribed in our software a trajectory that we want the fly to follow. So if we want the fly uh, to turn right, we sort of blow this snow to the right. And the fly may get the sensation, oh, whoops, I'm trying to fly straight. The world looks like it's, it's blowing to the right. That means I must be unintentionally turning to the left. So I better turn to the right and compensate for that unintentional motion. Uh, and so if we, if we just keep updating this sort of artificial vi visual feedback that we give the animal as it's flying around, we can actually cause it, we can redirect its own flight trajectory onto a path that, that we desire. And so we're taking advantage of this in the lab to do a lot of different things like study uh, the, using neurogenetic tools in Drosophila to study neural circuits for visual motor control um, and, and related kind of projects. Um, um, but before I get into, let's say, more visual motor navigation in, in insects and in flies, I just wanted to mention that we also uh, have demonstrated the use of this virtual reality system with fish, uh, for example, in collaboration with the lab of uh, Christine tesmar Reible, who is the uh, co-corresponding author with me on, on, on this paper. Um, and so there we built this beautiful fish bowl where fish are actually swimming in this, in this total uh, virtual reality world. So especially zebra fish, but we also worked on um, madaka fish there. Uh, and then with the lab of Wolf Haldenzak, we made an, el an elevated O maze acrophobia assay. So acrophobia is the fear of heights. And we could show that mice would um, perceive a virtual floor in a way very similarly, that would behave very similarly to how they would perceive uh, real floors. So unfortunately, today I don't have any more time to talk about that work, um, but I encourage you to, to check out that, the paper. OK, so I already showed all this, but there's actually another kind of major advantage of our, of our virtual reality system, which is that it allows to do really high throughput uh, kind of experiments and be able to do really kind of precise visual motor investigations uh, in a kind of a screening kind of context. So in terms of using Drosophila that, that we use in my lab, this is really key kind of advantage. It also allows instant environmental reconfiguration, as you saw for example, with the teleportation of the, of the fish into the world with and without the swarm. So I want to shift gears a little now to a specific uh, kind, of, kind of question and motivate that first by saying that, that we know that bees measure distance flown 
by a visual odometer. So bees do the waggle dance and they communicate the distance that they've flown um, to, their, to their sisters, but uh, it's becoming more and more clear that the way that they measure that distance is by measuring uh, the, the amount of visual flow that passed across their retina as they were flying along. Um, however, um, it's not actually entirely clear how this is really done. Um, and one of the major reasons why is that the, the amount of optical flow, so the, the visual motion that occurs on the retina, the pattern of light and dark over time as, as you move through the environment, the, the actual magnitude of visual velocity that you experience as you're flying along uh, depends on your altitude. So, you know, if you're up in an airplane a long way above the ground, the ground is moving past you very, very slowly in angular terms. And of course, if you're landing on a runway, you know, it's rushing past at a high speed. So this actually uh, could create a problem for, for a bee as it's trying to measure its flying distance. Um, and so here's the mathematical relationship that the, the, um, the speed of the visual motion is actually equal to the forward speed divided by the height. It could create a problem, um, and so there's this question, how do insects regulate their altitude? And this seems to be fundamentally related to the question also of how they may measure their distance flown. But actually, there's a really interesting hypothesis that was um, proposed by Franceschini and, and colleagues uh, a number of years ago that they use, a, an, the, they use a, a model, their model is that insects use ventral optic flow regulation. So the idea is that they regulate their height to maintain a preferred ventral motion. Um, so, so in other words, they would have a set point for a particular uh, visual speed, and if this visual speed they're experiencing at a certain moment would be too slow, they should descend in order to increase that. And if the visual speed they're experiencing underneath them is too fast, then they should ascend to decrease the speed. And in that way, one could imagine that different bees, if they had the same kind of uh, set point, they would always fly at the same height, and thereby that the amount of optical flow that they, that they experience would be consistent between different bees. So this ventral optic flow regulation hypothesis was really a um, clever idea that might explain how different bees would, would regulate their altitude and thereby allow them to, to have calibrated visual odometers across different individuals. So <clears throat> we wanted to test this uh, ventral optic flow regulator hypothesis using our kind of virtual reality system. Uh, and so let me, let me walk you through how we imagine this, this might work. So the idea would be, imagine that we could fix the floor to move at a particular speed underneath an insect as it's flying along. And so now I'm going to work on, on Drosophila. And so there's going to be, according to this model, there's going to be some preferred ventral um, angular velocity, let's call it omega zero, and that is going to be the speed at which the insect is not going to climb. It's going to have zero climb rate. If we go faster, it should ascend, and if we go slower, it should descend. So the model prediction is this, is this red line here. And using this virtual reality system, the idea is to explicitly test this hypothesis. Uh, and, and what we could do now is actually create a virtual open loop. So now my video is not showing, which is very unfortunate, as I tested it last night. Um, so I'm sorry about this. Um, okay, so, so what we show though, what, this, what, what, what we are able to do is that as the, as the fly is flying along here, uh, we can compensate for the motions of the fly, not only in terms of forward and backward motion, but also in terms of up and down motion, and actually make the size of the grating uh, constantly fixed so that, so that as the fly flies around, its own movement does not change uh, the, the visual pattern underneath it. Only what we prescribe changes that pattern. And that lets us really directly uh, present the stimuli that we showed in the previous graph, but to a freely moving, to a freely flying fly. And so if, if we do that, uh, here would be the, the line of prediction that's maybe the best fit for these two speeds, and you see, yeah, maybe at those two speeds, it works, but actually, if, if we go backwards, um, it, it, it doesn't seem to work. 
Um, and if you know something about insect vision, one of the major sort of questions is, um, you know, how is the sensitivity to the wavelength of, of the pattern there? Um, because that has implications for the mechanism of motion detection in, in the bee. And actually we know from, from other work, especially work of uh, Francis, uh, sorry, Srinivasan, that the B optic flow uh, measurement should be insensitive to the pattern of the, the, these actual visual stimulus. So if we test with, with other wavelengths of light, um, we, we get more data and actually we see that across a whole range of velocities, there's very little kind of um, agreement of the data with this prediction from the ventral optic flow regulator hypothesis. So the experimental evidence does not support this, this model. So how might these flies be regulating their elevation? So one of the things we noticed, and then we, we kind of picked up on and did some experiments on, is that if we had an edge in the arena, it seemed like the flies would fly at the height of that, of that edge. Uh, and so, in fact, we, just, we did some very simple experiments just holding stationary edges at different heights in the arena, and we, we could see, indeed, that they would fly those different heights. And actually, it would be the same if we had a, a white edge, a white shape underneath the edge and dark above, or also if we would invert the color. That's what the two different colors on the histograms here were. Um, so we also wanted to perform a conflict experiment, so where we would directly um, move the, the, we would directly control the ventral optic flow of the fly uh, while providing the fly with a strong visual edge on the side and then see, you know, which, which cue did the fly respond to? So the idea would be if we raise the edge, that would suggest that edge tracking is dominant, um, whereas if the fly maintained its flight on the floor, uh, relative to the floor, then this ventral motion would be dominant. And this is actually potentially an important control because now we're, we're no longer doing, you know, virtual open loop or something with the fly, so we just have a fixed pattern on the floor. And this means that any of the potential problems with our system, like uh, maybe the latency of the whole thing is just too long, those should not affect uh, this, this experiment. So now, yes, I'm worried that this video doesn't work. Of course it doesn't. Um, that was video of flies doing this experiment, but I can just show you the, the results. So if we lower the edge, um, actually flies seem to follow the, the edge lowering. If we raise the edge, flies seem to go up with, with the increasing edge. So it really seems like flies regulate their altitude by edge tracking, um, at least, you know, indoors in weird tunnels. And so the question still may be, you know, how is it that bees would actually regulate altitude and measure distance, uh, especially in, in, in the real world? So I, I'll get back to that right at the very end of my talk. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I discussed a little bit um, this, this visual odometer uh, idea, especially with bees and, and flying, one of the things that's been uh, really um, interesting for us has been the question of whether we could get distance estimation to work in Drosophila. And here we're really inspired by a lot of um, um, famous and, and really, really cool work on path integration in the desert ants, especially from um, Rudiger Vayner and, and colleagues over many years. And so here's a, here's a picture of this desert ant. And uh, they, they do these kind of classic relocation experiments where the idea is the ant leaves its nest, it's looking for food, it's wandering around, it's taking a circuitous route. And then when it gets to a feeder, um, it picks up like a, a crumb of a cookie or uh, something that the experimenters may have, may have left for it. Uh, and then in, in the classic experiment, the, the experimenters will pick up the ant, translate it to the side by, by some meters, and then release it again. And uh, wh what the ant will do is it will walk in the direction and distance home again and then when it gets to the fictive location of its nest, so the place where it should remember its nest to be, if it did not notice this relocation, then it starts turning around and doing what looks like a, a search, looking, looking again for its nest. So in my mind, this is a kind of key evidence that the insects can do path integration. And, and so what that means is that every point along the trajectory, the, the insect is updating its internal estimate of the direction and the distance home again. So we took uh, 
inspiration from these kind of experiments and we were wondering if we could um, measure path integration in Drosophila. And so um, the, the way we did that is by taking advantage of um, a lot of the neurogenetic tools in flies and so the, what, what, we're, what I will show you about here takes advantage of cells expressing a protein called GR43A, gustatory receptor, which is a sugar receptor. Um, and if you look at the different cells in the fly that express this, um, they're actually in, in several different interesting locations, like in the legs, maybe where you might expect, in the, essentially in the, in the lips and the mouth parts, um, and even in the uterus and, and the brain. So there, there are a lot of actually interesting questions there. But right now, um, the important part is that we're taking advantage of neurogenetic techniques and expressing a light-gated ion channel called crimson, an optogenetic tool, um, and so when we turn a red light on, we can create the taste of sugar in these flies, or we artificially activate these neurons in these flies. So I, I think we can call this a taste virtual reality. And so now um, the idea of the experiment would be, you know, can we reward the flies with the taste of sugar in a particular location? and then see if they remember that location, if they come back to that location. So I'm going to tell you uh, results of experiments from Anna Titova, a, a talented PhD student in the lab. And so what Anna did uh, together, together with our colleagues here is build this, um, this arena. And the idea is we have got a red LED, which is going to activate these crimson ion channels. Flies are walking down around here. And when the fly enters a small region of the arena here, actually even smaller than the region where the LED shines, we will we can turn on the LED and give it this, this taste of sugar. And then we have a camera up here so that we can track the fly as it's walking around and control all of this live. Uh, and so if we do kind of a simple uh, proof of concept experiment, we can see the fly walking around. And then at a certain point in time, if the fly walks into our reward zone, we turn the LED on and it looks like maybe the fly behavior suddenly changes, that it seems attracted to that particular location. And then maybe after doing this for a couple minutes, uh, the fly might leave a few times, but then we, we turn off the LED and we won't turn it on again. The fly leaves uh, and then it comes back again. And this red, uh, sorry, this yellow color indicates that we would have turned on the LED there, but actually we didn't. So we don't turn on the LED and then the fly leaves again and then maybe comes back again later, maybe again later. And so the question is, you know, are these uh, returns to near this, this reward zone, are these, path integration, are these path integration mediated returns? So um, these experiments I'm going to tell you about have all been done in the dark. So there is no visual navigation possible, no visual memory that's possible. Um, we are doing these experiments with this optogenetic stimulation, uh, so there should be no, there are no food cues available. Um, but if all we did is what I told you about, there would be the concern of, of pheromones, that maybe the flies marked the location where they got the reward by leaving a little drop of something that smells good. And we know, of course, many ant species leave uh, chemical trails to return uh, to, to food sources. Uh, and so, what, what we did then, what Anna did, is she built this relocation slider. And so the idea would be that after we rewarded the fly in one location, we could slide it to the side and ask, uh, did it, does it return to the original location or does it return to the fictive reward? So where it should return to if it remembered the, the food location based on integrating its own movement. Okay, so here's kind of a schematic of the arena I just showed you. The slider would initially be here, and then after the fly got rewarded at the actual reward zone, Anna would translate it um, here, and then the fictive reward zone would be translated by the same amount as we, from the actual reward zone, as we translated the, the slider. Okay. So if flies remember the reward location using path integration, they should go to the fictive reward zone. Uh, on the other hand, if they smell or taste the food location due to, for example, pheromones that the fly left behind, and there are actually also examples with Drosophila able to leave uh, pheromones that, that are attractive for naive flies, for example, then they will go to the actual reward zone. Okay, so the experiments ran as follows. 
There was a, a five or more minute baseline acclimation period for the flies to walk around in this arena. Then there was a 60 second stimulation period where um, if the flies were in the actual reward zone, the LED uh, would be on. And we would do this for a total of 60 seconds of LED on. Then there would be a post stimulation period of variable duration while Anna waited for the fly to walk onto the slider. Uh, and then the moment that the fly would walk onto the slider, she would try and very carefully slide this to the side. Uh, and then we would begin the test period, which was just um, measuring, you know, where the fly was and where it walked around. And in particular, you know, the analysis would look at, did it go to the fictive reward zone? Did it go to the actual reward zone? Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so now here are histograms of where the fly was walking in our arenas in the baseline stimulation and post-stimulation period for rewarded flies um, and the same genotype of flies with all of the same um, genetic manipulations but where we just literally unplugged the LED. So these flies are not going to be getting the reward in this stimulus period. So you see already in the, in the stimulus zone uh, these flies don't accumulate here. Um, and so this, this is one kind of control that we've done. Um, and now, if we look at where the flies were in the test period, uh, and we can see that the flies actually uh, return to this uh, rewarded location. And this is something that is not done by the non-rewarded flies. So this would be consistent with the idea that the flies are using a path integration to return to this rewarded location. So, so it seems that flies remember reward locations and that could be independent of pheromones. So we can look at the behavior in, in a little bit more detail. So for example, um, the, so here are now trajectories right after the relocation aligned to, so that each fly starts at, the, at, at that particular point. Um, and we draw then the average direction in purple that the flies moved in the rewarded case and in the non-rewarded case. And the average direction of the relocation was this way, and the average direction back to the fictive or to the fictive reward zone is given by this orange line. So it actually seems that the rewarded flies, but not the non-rewarded flies, go to the direction of the fictive reward. And so here's a little bit more statistics on that: is a histogram showing the direction to the fictive reward zone, and most flies actually go more or less in that direction if they've been rewarded. So we can also quantify, for example. How much time do the two different groups of flies spend either in the fictive reward zone or the actual reward zone? So the rewarded flies spend more time in the fictive reward zone than in the actual reward zone. So the, the, those points would be underneath the diagonal. Um, and the non-rewarded flies spend more or less uh, equal time, like zero time actually, in, in both. Um, so it really seems that flies are able to remember reward location. Um, and if you remember the, the location of that peak, also the, the, the distance that they walk. So this is now a really exciting result for us because it means we can start to use all of the uh, you know, genetic tools in flies to start to study you know, how does a fly know how far it walked. Okay, so what I've told you so far is that virtual reality is a useful tool to study animal navigation, that distance estimation, that distance estimation and height control are coupled, that flies can use edges to regulate height. Bees uh, reliably measure flown distance, but the mechanisms are unclear. Uh, and that flies can measure and remember distance and direction to perform path integration. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, and you know, obviously there's, there's some future steps and some future directions. And I would like to talk about those just for a couple minutes here. Um, so, so first of all, you know, can we use Drosophila as a model for insect navigation? So I think, for example, these, these path integration results are um, positive in, in that direction, but there's also a, a number of other things that I'm really excited about that I will um, discuss in a moment. Uh, and then can we study bee navigation in the real world? So, you know, one of the questions is always, you do all these uh, experiments in the laboratory and, you know, they're very interesting, but, you know, how much do they really transfer to, for example, you know, a different species, even in a totally different order of insects? And do they transfer outside of the lab? So <clears throat> to, to the first question of, can we use Drosophila as a model for insect navigation? So in, oh no, this video is also not playing. This is a nightmare. Um, uh, 
Okay. Okay. Let me, yeah, okay, let's see here. Yes, thank you so much for that advice. Really cool. Okay, I never knew. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this video is a, is a recent video from the lab of uh, Vivek Jairaman and uh, with Hannah Haberkern as, as first author. And so what, what she's done, she's made a virtual reality system for a fly walking on a little um, spherical treadmill. Um, and the, she can, they can produce, you know, visual worlds of, of arbitrary complexity uh, now for a fly which is rigidly tethered. Um, and, you know, I would have my concerns about if the proprioceptive information is actually perfectly appropriate for this fly um, and so on. And I think these are actually interesting and, and, and valid questions. But what's really cool uh, that they can do about, about putting the fly um, in, in this rigidly tethered way and looking at this kind of behaviors is that they can also cut a little hole in the back of the fly head and measure uh, calcium activity in, in the brain. And so what they discovered, um, so with Johannes Zielig and Vivek Jayaman now several years ago, are these neurons in the central complex, uh, part of the central complex called the ellipsoid body, um, that, that you see there's this bump of activity that, that rotates around this, this ellipsoid body. And it actually turns out, so they did, did a really amazing job showing this, that the, the location of this bump of activity, which is shown in red here, it actually corresponds to the accumulated ball rotation angle that the, that the fly has. So if the fly turns uh, the ball, this bump of activity also turns. So through, through uh, a number of really cool experiments, what they showed is that this bump of activity really seems to be uh, like a compass in the, in the fly brain. Uh, and so now, this is already six years ago, and I have to say that the field has just absolutely um, exploded. These are fascinating results that have captured a lot of interest in, in a lot of labs. Um, and there's a lot of progress now being made on, on the circuitry about, about how Drosophila might, might navigate. Um, and maybe just to pick a, a, a more recent paper uh, from um, the lab of, of Gabi Maimon, um, a collaboration with Larry Abbott and, and Cheng Lu, uh, I don't have time to go into this uh, really elegant and sophisticated work, but what they show is that uh, activity in another part of the central complex, the fan-shaped body, um, actually is able to compute um, essentially vector math using a really interesting kind of implementation, neural implementation, uh, that allows flies to know what direction they're traveling even if they're heading in a, in a different direction. So it's absolutely fascinating uh, work, and I, I, in, a, in a few seconds, there's no way I can do it justice. So I really recommend um, checking that out. Um, so I think the, the future is really bright for using Drosophila as a model uh, for, for insect navigation. But, but still, even so, uh, the, the question is always going to remain, uh, you know, how much can we learn about Drosophila? How much does that apply? To these, to these other species. So there's also a lot of uh, really interesting work going on in, in other insect species. And I'm just gonna mention a, a tiny bit of what we're doing in the lab. So um, we, what we'd really like to be able to do is to study bee navigation in, in the real world. So I'm gonna show a movie, which will hopefully play, of a, of a high resolution um, insect tracking device uh, that we'd like to get working on bees, you know, outdoors in the wild. So this is actually developed as a stepping stone to image brains of freely moving animals, actually in the kind of circumstances that we, that we just saw. It's a kind of complicated apparatus. I'm happy to tell you about it. You can, you can read about it. <clears throat> and this has all been done in collaboration with the Human Frontier Science Program uh, postdoctoral fellow, Tang Vo Doan, who I'm happy to have uh, in the lab. And so I'm going to show you a movie made with this, with this system where we have a beetle that's wearing a retroreflector. Um, and we have this optical system w locked onto the beetle. And so what you're going to see here is uh, th this beetle starting to fly, and we're going to have a, a video where we're actually able to resolve, for example, the antennae of the beetle as it's flying around, or, or the legs. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, right now, this is in the laboratory. This was actually a really very, very early kind of prototype of this, of this whole system, now almost uh, done almost two years ago. There are a lot of ideas that we have uh, about how to improve this. 
and we are now really working on getting this getting this working for for bees um, in in the real world, and that's funded through a through a really generous grant from the Volkswagen Foundation. Um, so you know, stay tuned. I'm I'm really excited what we're going to be able to do uh, studying bee behavior in in their natural circumstances, really at kind of a high resolution. Okay, so now I just want to end my whole talk by, by uh, several, several thank yous. So obviously a huge number of people have helped with, with a lot of aspects of all of this that I've said. So the free moving virtual reality was a collaboration um, in, in my lab with postdoc uh, John Stowers and, and Max Hofbauer. A number of other people have also contributed a lot over the years. That all started in the lab of Michael Dickinson. Um, and it was in his lab where I did this Drosophila altitude control study uh, with a strong collaboration with Sarah and Lee. The, um, I, I've discussed sort of also in preparation for this presentation today a lot about virtual reality with Hannah Haberkern, Tara Donker, and Michaela de Matai. So thank, thanks to them for some really interesting um, and, and um, thought-provoking conversations about virtual reality. Anna Titova did these experiments on the Drosophila path integration and there are a number of other people in the lab uh, whose work is, is really exciting, but I just uh, don't have uh, time to discuss today. And um, the, the final thing is just to thank all of our generous sponsors over the years. We, we really couldn't have done this work without, without, um, without their help. So finally, thank you for your, for your attention and thanks once again to the Animal Behavior Live team for inviting me to give this, to give this talk. It's a great opportunity. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for this uh, amazing talk. Um, so we already have one question on the chat uh, from A.B. George. Uh, which is saying that great talk and a fantastic experiment. Uh, have you tried moving the slider to different distances in the test? So incre increasing distance uh, between the actual and fictive ARZ to see how this affects path integration. Yeah, so in fact, what we, we have, um, and I, you know, did not make a, a, a um, I did not emphasize that at the time. Let me see if I can go back here to this. Um, in fact, because Anna has to move the slider a, uh, by hand, um, and that's something we're working on automating, actually, but because she has to move the slider by hand, the fly moves actually a different distance every single uh every single trial. And so in fact, these, these results here, you see we don't draw the black circle there, that's because we have aligned them to the post-translation um, location. Uh, and, and so we, they're no longer fixed with regard to the arena, like the actual reward zone is, they're now fixed with regard to where we move the fly to. Um, and so in fact, we sort of naturally did, I think the experiment that you that you propose, not actually because we intended to, but just because we couldn't avoid it. And in fact, if we plot the trajectories in the original coordinate system, it, they're, they're just a bit more blurred out because, because uh, they, this fictive reward is, you know, it's only in reference to that fictive translation location. So I actually think we've done the, we've actually done the experiment that you propose and actually I think it's consistent with the idea, the results are consistent with the idea that the flies are doing path integration. Thanks for this answer. Um, so we have Said um, who is asking thanks for your, uh, I mean, we're telling thanks for your interesting tool first, and uh, who is wondering if there are indications of spontaneous alternation behavior in insects or not. Oh, I think this is a huge, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I should have um, um, discussed this. So actually, so if, if we go back, for example, to that ventral optic flow regulator hypothesis, um, let's see here, here's a good example, right? So, so you know, the idea might be, well, so the, the idea of Franceschini is that the bee would be maintaining a particular ventral optic flow and that this is the goal of the, the control system that the bee runs. Um, and, you know, if you watch, and, and under that model, actually, if you watch insects flying around, if, if that's your idea, uh, then, you know, any time that an insect would sort of deviate from fixed, f from a position where that variable was, was held, where, where your model says it should be held, 
you would have to say that that is noise. Um, but if you've ever tried to catch an insect, uh, you know that actually the precision and the speed with which they can control their flight trajectory is, is extremely high. So I don't think these deviations uh, from, from you know, these simple control laws that one might propose, I actually don't propose, I don't think that those are noise in the insect nervous system or sensory system or motor system. I think those are, I think those are the insect doing more or less exactly what it wants to do. Uh, and, um, yeah, and, and I think it's going to be really a challenge to try to identify control laws that the insect might be trying to implement that govern its moment-by-moment -moment behavior. Uh, that's actually exactly the, the PhD project that Yonatan Cohen uh, is working on in my lab. There's also really, uh, really cool work that really demonstrated, uh, for the first time to my knowledge, uh, that insects that if you use this kind of average trajectory as the goal of a controller that you would propose insects are using, um, that that actually gives you sort of the, the wrong answer. Um, and in fact, it's a, it's a very similar kind of topic. It's, a, it's about how bees uh, land on flowers and how they use their, their visual, um, visual control to regulate this landing process from the lab of Florian Moires in Wageningen University um, in the Netherlands and first author uh, Pulkit Goyal. So they've, they've just published a couple papers in the past year exactly about this topic. So I think, I think it's really, um, so I, I think this is a major underappreciated aspect uh, of insect behavior or of animal behavior that, that we actually really need to look at the individual trajectories to, to try and infer what it is they're trying to do. So thank you for that question, and it, I, I should think about how to incorporate that a bit better into my talk next time. So thank you for saying. Um, so we receive another question from Ofer Feynman. Um, so first, he say thanks for this wonderful talk. Um, are there ways to use your virtual reality system to weigh in on the argument regarding the possibility that insects may be using a cognitive map to navigate? Yeah, so I think, right, so, so maybe, um, so the question is, are insects, especially bees, for example, using a cognitive map to, to navigate? Um, and I think this, this, is, this is a really fascinating question. Um, and I, you know, this is absolutely, I would say, you know, major topic, you know, both for me and for, for another number of other uh, people, many people in the insect navigation community are, are interested exactly in the question of, you know, what algorithms are, are used by the insects as they navigate. And uh, I, I certainly think virtual reality is, is, is a way to address that. So in fact, I hope that um, you would agree that these, these experiments looking at the ventral optic flow regulator hypothesis um, was one way in which we actually could do that, in which we could make use of it. And maybe, you're, maybe what you're asking is, um, would you imagine doing, for example, virtual reality outdoors um, in, in the real world? And I think that's, that's a really uh, exciting idea. And I, you know, the major problems that I would see that would be, you know, just uh, technical problems, like, like having a display that would be bright enough to be seen um, in sunlight if you're going to study a, an animal which is active during the day. Um, but I think those kind of problems are actually solvable. So I think one could even imagine doing, you know, virtual reality for a freely flying bee, even outdoors in the wild. But but you could probably also do it in the lab with virtual reality. So this this also would be an exciting thing to do to get bees in into our VR setups. Thank you, um, Natasha Rossi is asking: Do you think wind could play a role in altitude sensing in bees? Well, there's old work from um, John S. Kennedy. Uh, who was studying um, actually many things, but actually one of the one of the observations that Franceschini's ventral optic flow regulator model kind of predicted, um, I mean retroactively predicted. But so Kennedy discovered that locusts, when they're flying into a headwind, would fly lower, and when they were flying with a tailwind, they would they would fly higher. And so that's exactly consistent with the with this ventral optic flow regulator kind of hypothesis. So the 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 hypothesis would be yes. 
Um, and so there's a, there, there is literature where honeybees, um, I'm thinking of a paper from the 1960s and I can't remember the, the author's first name. I mean, they showed that bees are quite capable of, of going, to, um, going to food sources in, in different crosswind conditions and, and remembering those, those locations. But I don't think that they investigated the altitude at which the bees flew under these circumstances. So that would exactly be, you know, something we would like to, to be able to measure. Great, thank you. Uh, so waiting for some more questions on the chat, I will, I will have uh, one question myself. Um, so like, while I was working with uh, virtual reality in, in bees and, and uh, especially uh, while I was trying to, to characterize some brain mechanisms, I always had one question uh, that keep in mind, and maybe the same for you, is is how much what I'm finding in terms of brain mechanism in virtual reality is relevant to uh, what could actually happen in, in reality inside the brain. And, and I was wondering if um, you already managed to get some evidence that, for instance, uh, for, for a fly tested uh, in the same environment, but uh, display in uh, reality and display in uh, in virtual reality, you observe the same uh, brain activation or maybe different brain activation. I mean, this is this. Oh, so, in terms of uh, in terms of walking, this is exactly why we have the goal to image the brain as as a fly is walking freely, as opposed to you know walking while rigidly held under a microscope. Um, so, and, and, you know, this has actually already been done. So, um, Drew Grover and Ralph Greenspan published a paper called Flyception 2, I think last year in, uh, Nature Neuroscience, if I remember right, which actually shows them, um, you know, imaging brain activity, uh, in a, in a freely walking Drosophila. So I think this is soon going to move out of the world of, of science fiction to, to reality, um, and... It's going to be very, very interesting what happens. I mean, I think that the, I, I could imagine that flies walking on treadmills, the, the, I mean, obviously Drosophila is a tiny, tiny insect and it's difficult to make a treadmill, which is sort of perfectly matched for the, for the dynamics of a fly. I, I could imagine, for example, that their ability to measure distances um, is kind of screwed up because this treadmill is going to be maybe too heavy for them or not the right, not the right dynamics. So it may be that actually studying path integration would be would be greatly uh, facilitated by doing brain imaging uh, in a freely behaving fly. Okay, thanks for this answer. Um, and I, I was wondering also, like for you, what is the the, the future of virtual reality more in terms of technology? Like, will do you think that will will uh, will go further? Uh, maybe like I, I was thinking with uh, like. I was thinking about augmented reality, for instance, like that we could try to make the same kind of thing for animals. Uh, like, do, do you have uh, do you have any um, any clue about what is the future for this? Yeah. Um, so augmented reality is also very interesting. Um, so I would say, I mean, just in terms of very low level, sort of. Um, technology questions. I mean, we, we, our virtual reality system is, is also free and, and open source. Um, but I might suggest that if you're building a new, if you're interested in building a new virtual reality system, maybe to check out this uh, Unity games engine, because this, this is like, you know, 80% of computer games are now written in Unity and there's just a huge ecosystem, which provides a lot of benefits. And like the, the virtual reality movie I showed from Hannah Habercon, she's using uh, Unity. Um, but at this at this bigger picture level, um, I mean, I, I've seen augmented reality in use for humans in a couple different ways. So in terms of actually kind of a anxiety reduction approach, there's some really cool work from, for example, Tara Donker, where she's really shown in really carefully controlled uh, clinical trials that, for example, having, you know, your, your phone and having an app on your phone that will show a spider kind of walking around allows you, if you have a phobia uh, about spiders, it allows you in a kind of very controlled way to see spiders and experience spiders and kind of become comfortable with the image of a spider while at the same time, you know, maybe knowing it's not really a real spider. Um, 
And then, you know, there's the idea of augmented reality that you can get all this extra information about things without needing to, you know, look at your phone or, or, or you know, type into a computer. So that, that's exciting. Both of those things are the major things how I know augmented reality is being used. And I'm, I'm probably not creative enough to think about how, you know, animal behavior researchers might be able to use that to, to, improve, their, to improve their science. Um, but certainly, like in a quote from uh, Lanier at the right at the beginning, I mean, there's this infinity of possibilities. And often, you know, I find, you know, our minds, at least my own mind, is, is you know, just way too constrained by what I know from the physical world to, to, to try and, you know, to be able to design the perfect experiment. It often takes a lot of iterations realizing, oh, wait a minute, we could just do this crazy thing, which, which wouldn't be possible in the real world. So... Yeah, like, like, I mean, yeah, because when I say augmented reality, I think I was also having in mind uh, holographic uh, technology, but I think we are maybe not advanced enough to use it uh, because like it will be a, a nice way to increase virtual reality at the end uh, by proposing something virtual, but in three dimension to the animal. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, we could also discuss uh, limitations of this system. So mm -hmm. we render we render here only for a single viewpoint. So if an animal has stereopsis and, and the animals I showed essentially have very little stereopsis, um, then you, you, this system would need to be, you'd need some changes, some improvements. Um, so, I mean, one could imagine like a light field display, for example, which could be made today probably at relatively low resolution and at, and at high cost to generate a kind of a more uh, direct kind of 3D representation for a stereo, you know, for a stereo viewing kind of situation. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be technical developments possible and, you know, some of them would be, you know, only basically throwing more money at the problem and getting, you know, higher performance projectors mm -hmm. or cameras or whatever, but some of them will require a kind of new, you know, exploiting new physical, new physics or physics that haven't been exploited for virtual reality before. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So